One of the theologians who's gotten a lot of attention in recent years is Herman Bovink. Now, who was Herman Bovink and why should you read him? Today, we're going to talk about that question with somebody who studied Bovink at a high level. Hello, welcome to Clarity and Brevity. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Grace Utantu of RTS Reformed Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C., who has done a Ph.D. on Herman Bovink's theology. So, Gray, welcome to the channel. Thanks, Brandon, for having me. So, you've thought a lot about Bovink. People have been talking about Bovink in recent years, uh, but he's not a really recent theologian. He's somewhat recent. Can you tell us uh, who was Herman Bovink? Yeah, thanks. Herman Bovink was born in 1854. He passed away in 1921. He was, uh, for, for many years anyway, seen as a sort of theological right-hand man to Abraham Kuyper. But now, because of the recent English translations, we're finally seeing his significance and his genius in his own right. I think of um, Boving and Kuyper, Abraham Kuyper and Herman Boving, as kind of like Plato and Aristotle, Luther and Calvin, Kuyper, the more occasional, fierce, sort of quicker thinker, but Boving, the slower, more reflective, patient, dogmatician, systematizer, of what Kuiper had started and therefore refined many things of, of Kuiper's project. Both of them started what we might not now call the neo-Calvinist tradition, this revival of reformed confessional theology in the Netherlands within the context of a secularizing modern European culture and seeking therefore to show that our old reformed tradition is not a hindrance, but a resource to engage in secular modernity and modern philosophy and all those sort of things. So uh, maybe you can say a word about what is Bovink known for today. Maybe he was known for different things in his own day, but but how would somebody come across Bovink today? Right. And I think right now people would see today, as I've mentioned before, no longer just under the shadow of Kuiper as, a right, as his right-hand man, but really a, a systematician, a dogmatician in his own right, codifying reform theology for the modern age. And people would have seen him uh, through his reform dogmatics, his four-volume magisterial magnum opus coming out of Baker Academic, translated there between 2003 and 2008. We've got the Dutch originals right here behind me, kind of dusty and musky now. Um, but yeah, that was just recently translated. I mean, Bovink completed that at the turn to the 20th century. I think the last one in the first edition was 1901, 1903. That was released. Second edition completed 1911, I believe. And um now we're finally reading it, and and we're seeing his, his again all of that clarity, his genius in combining reform theology to engage modernity, and also therefore um, a, a very engaged systematic theology. We'll put it that way. So a lot of people would look to Bobink now as one of the first ones off the shelf, uh, one of the the most helpful resources. Can right. you talk specifically about his exegetical method? Maybe what's distinctive about his theology? Uh, in in those reform dogmatics. Yeah, thanks. So in terms of his method and his reform dogmatics, you could actually see a pretty clear outline of each particular doctrine that he is covering. In each particular doctrine, the outline is always, he starts with the Bible, starts with some exegetical conclusions and observations covering Old and New Testaments. And then after that, he's going to talk about how that doctrine from those scriptural texts develops through ancient, medieval, reformational, and finally the modern period. And within that survey of the historical development of the doctrine, you might get Bobbing's voice here and there, but he's actually very patiently descriptive. A lot of people say um, that they would confuse themselves because they're not sure where Bobbing's voice begins and where it ends because he's describing these people so well that they're suddenly thinking, well, wait a minute, is he into that heresy? I, I thought he was against that, but he's just describing it so well for you because he's interested to show that we stand on people in the past when we stand on them and we learn from them. We're also learning from the errors that they have came across and they've responded to those errors. And finally, in the final section, you'd probably get his own voice, his own constructive take on the particular doctrine. So what I tell my students is, you know, you should probably get to the very end of each chapter, end of each loci, before you can actually discern Bobby's own mm -hmm. voice. So that's that's in terms of his method. Um, two other things perhaps could be said about his, um, what makes him so attractive from his reformed dogmatics. We've already mentioned his patience with modern thinkers. He believes that it is the responsibility of the theologian to respond to the particular questions of your own day. Our dogmatics doesn't change, our theology doesn't change, the scriptures do not change, but the questions that modern people have, the questions of each age, each context do change. And so as responsible theologians, we cannot just regurgitate the past, but we must apply the past to the current context. 
And so because Bobbin was writing in the modern period, and he combines both orthodoxy and that modern engagement, people are realizing, like, oh, this is a model for us. This is how we can continue to be confessionally reformed and yet be serviceable to our own age. And, and thirdly, I would say he's, he's very holistic. He's not interested in just um, describing eternal truths that do not touch our lives. I think he's, he's very much interested in showing, demonstrating how those internal truths live in every area of life. This is a, a distinctive of that neo-Calvinist movement. One might call it holistic Calvinism. Um, his argument is that Reformed theology is a, a leavening principle that which transforms every area of life because we live before the face of God. And so he's got a lot of thoughts on how Christianity impacts philosophy, how Christianity impacts culture, and so on. And um, for him, the modern age and all of its holistic forms of unbelief poses for us an opportunity to also show the counterpart of the holistic form of Christianity that we have in the Reformed faith. Now, when it comes to systematic theology, uh, some people who maybe who are watching this may not have that much exposure to it. One of the things that might be striking when you read Bob Inc., and not just Bob Inc., but he's a great example, is how exegetical it is. Uh, can you talk about some of his exegetical background and what people should expect in terms of how contemporary are some of the debates he's engaging in those exegetical discussions? Yeah, thanks. Um, his exegetical background and his conviction for why exegesis is the foundation for dogmatics is because in his um, principled method, he would argue that theology is grounded in revelation. And revelation comes via two means, general and special revelation. What distinguishes general revelation from special is that general revelation is non-propositional, non-verbal. It's the de declaration of the heavens for the glory of God. The, the heavens are declaring that without a voice, without a speech, and yet we all know God. And that general revelation actually creates guilt in us because we repress the truth. And so what we actually need is special revelation, a verbal revelation, especially this side of the fall, where God discloses himself in propositional ways, in clear ways. And so if we want to know God, we better take seriously that self-revelation of God in Holy Scripture. If God has disclosed himself there, this is how we get to know him truly as he is, not as a projection of our own reasoning, a projection of our own imagination. And so uh, this is why Bobby, again, starts every single chapter with an exegetical portion on passages of Holy Scripture. He's very convicted about the speech of God, therefore, is the authority for all theology and also the continuity between general, sorry, between um, Old and New Testaments, especially seen in covenant theology, for instance. And yeah, you're right. He's, he's, he's going to appeal to um, technical exegetical discussions at important junctures of the dogmatics to establish this or that point. Let me just maybe give two examples of that. First is that he he argues, for instance, that Christ is the second Adam. You would know a lot more about that, Brandon. Um, but but he argues that Christ is the second Adam in the sense that he was following in Adam's footsteps to reverse what Adam had failed to do and also to complete what he had failed to do. So um, Christ comes as one who, in Adam's place, obeys the covenant of works, for instance. So he's going to appeal to a lot of passages in, in the Holy Scriptures for that. You know, in 1 Corinthians 15, he's got a couple of passages that I feel like actually anticipates Richard Gavin's book, Resurrection and Redemption, showing that the spiritual body um, that we will have in the resurrection life is actually Adam's anticipated and promised body in the covenant of works, for instance. He's got great sections on, on little things like that. The other example is the idea of who we are is made in the image of God, which we could talk about later on as well. When, when, when Bobbing says that we're made in the image of God, he argues that, that this is within the context of God giving the creation mandate to Adam and Eve. And so the image of God for him has to take into account not only that we are metaphysically made in God's image, but also corporately made in God's image. As we're being fruitful and as we're multiplying, we should actually see the glory of God throughout all the ends of the earth manifesting God more by way of this corporate humanity spreading across the earth. And actually, people now would see this as a crucial component if we are as made in the image of God. People, theologians call this the, the vocational aspect of the image of God. Some biblical studies authors would say that this is the only aspect of the image of God that is clearly exegetically found, for instance, uh, which I would probably um, disagree with. But Bobbing was already anticipating those discussions, even in the exegetical material. So what was it about Bobbing that led you to want to study him at the PhD level? 
Yeah. So uh, what I say now to, to folks, my sort of 30 second elevator pitch is that he's more orthodox than Bart, but more culturally engaged than Edwards. So if you think about modern evangelical reformed um, sort of scholarly sensibilities, they, they tended to gravitate at least the last 20 years or so towards Bart or Edwards, those sort of the two figures that people study the most. But as I read Boving, he was way more, I think, historically sensitive to the reformed tradition and the Catholic tradition more broadly than Bart. Um, and and in, in contrast, at least to my reading of Edwards, um, he is much more interested in directly engaging with um, the modern culture and modern ideas, modern contexts. Uh, not to say that Edwards wasn't engaged in some of those questions, but Bobbing was more explicitly so um, and more programmatic in his approach. So I think, again, this this vertical and horizontal dimension made me really try to, to, to Bobbing. This horizontal dimension of modern culture and the vertical dimension of God's revelation throughout time and tradition. And so just for the sake of those who are watching, you're talking about Karl Barth and Jonathan yeah. Edwards. Carl Barth and Jonathan Edwards, yeah. that's right. Um, now, maybe you've answered this already, but for somebody who might be interested in, in picking up Bob Inc., uh, who, who might be wondering, is it worth the time? What are some of the benefits of reading Bob Inc. today since he lived in you know the middle of the 19th century and he was writing towards you know, the turn of the 20th century? Uh, why, why should people today read Bob Inc.? Yeah, you mentioned the time gap, but I think it's incredible how prescient Bob Inc. was to current issues and how similar Bobbing's issues were to today. So I think today we're, we're always considering how to live with people who are deeply different from us, people with different worldviews in a pluralistic context. That's exactly Bobbing's context in the Netherlands. He was trying to think about how our doctrines in the Bible actually help us leap, uh, live in those ways. So the doctrines of common grace, the doctrines of total depravity, the antithesis and things like that. These are all doctrines from Bobbing and Kuiper. And they were they were mining these things from the from scriptures because they were reflecting on the ways in which their Christian faith is um, rejected, misunderstood, and also um, in the decline within the, the European context. And I think now, especially in the United States, we see commentaries now about you know Christianity being in decline. So I think it's extra relevant for us today to mine these authors who lived in a very similar context. The second thing is you get a full orbed. Um, historical theology alongside your systematic theology. Our doctrines don't just come out of nowhere, as we mentioned before. Our doctrines come to us as we are receiving them from our traditions. Um, the scriptures are not to be read and reread as if the tradition never happened, right? And we live on uh, the shoulders of, and we stand on the shoulders of these reformed giants and also medieval giants, ancient giants that came before us. And Bavink gives you the lay of the land very clearly and very usefully before we get to the articulation of the doctrine. And I think thirdly, we also see over and over again in Bobbing's works how those doctrines have an immediate impact in your life. So he's interested in how, um, you know, a theologian calls this the effective salience of doctrine, the empirical granularity of doctrine, that it makes a difference for you, even in your daily walk, even right now. Right. So maybe somebody's interested in reading Bobbing and they haven't read him before. This this is one of four volumes. This is just volume one. Where would you suggest somebody start uh, if they wanted to read Bobbing? Yeah, I think the best place to start is the wonderful works of God, which is this distillation of the Reformed dogmatics for the layperson. And if you want a further distillation of even the wonderful works of God, I mean, the Reformed dogmatics is four volumes, as you mentioned. The wonderful works of God is a 600-page distillation of that. There's a 200-page distillation of the wonderful works of God called the Guidebook for the Christian Religion, which is actually written for high schoolers and college students. So that's that's really worth uh, getting as an entryway for that, for his old Very theology. Good. So, and do you have, uh, maybe you can mention a few things that you've done on Bob Inc., if those might be interested in what you've done on Bob Inc. Yeah, so um, over the last few years, and we haven't just written on Bob Inc., we've also translated some of the lesser known, but no less important works on Bob Inc., especially on things like worldview, Christianity and science, for instance, and also philosophy of revelation. So we translated his 1904 text, Christian Worldview, where we have the primary source of the premier theologian on worldview. I mean, talk of worldview was primarily a, a modern Christian reality, Christian worldview, for instance, but it's kind of become watered down, especially in the Anglophone world now. And, and so we do well to just revisit the primary sources for how Bobbing the original um, progenitor of talk of Christian worldview really comes from because it's way more nuanced. It's not we talk of Christian worldview as kind of like a weapon. I have a Christian worldview. You don't. Ha, so I win. 
here's my better take because I have a Christian worldview. But they never talked about it in that way. They talked about a Christian worldview not as something quickly that you could put on, as if it's a pair of spectacles, nor is it just um, reducible to a set of propositions about God and all things in relation to God. But he talks about it like it's a map, and it requires, therefore, a holistic corporate Christian enterprise that you can't work on the map alone, that you need the team uh, to work on that map together. And he talks about it in terms of the whole Christian church coming together to form um, a, a full orb reception of the divine revelation. And that's what a Christian worldview is. So it's never actually completed. And it's something that you are you are entering into as you as you become a Christian and as you engage with these past authors and present authors and so on. Um, Christianity and Science was just released this year, August 26th, I believe. And Christianity and Science is about, it's kind of like his manifesto for how Christianity makes a difference for higher learning for the university, not just the natural sciences, but also the humanities, religious studies, the discipline of history, for so on, and so on. So it's really going to be very interesting if you're engaged in higher learning, if you're a teacher, if you're a student, that would be really worthwhile for you. Yeah, thank you, Gray. I will leave links to some of these resources in the notes for this episode, so you can track those down if you're interested. Thanks for watching. I hope this has been helpful. And remember to keep it clear and focus on Christ.